Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon um, for Human Futures and Histories, which will hopefully uh, enliven your afternoon. Uh, my name is Cory, I'm the moderator for today's panel, and we have three wonderful practitioners and makers and artists here with us today from both Singapore and Malaysia. Um, so how this will work is the, each of them will talk a little bit about certain parts of their practices that intersects with this broader topic, maybe going into certain directions or taking certain paths, and then uh, we'll do a round of discussion on a, on a kind of broader context of our history and our, our, our kind of uh, engagements with this, and then we'll go into maybe more specific, deeper excavations about each of their practices um, in relation to the theme that we are all working around. Um, but first of all, I thought I would introduce these three wonderful people next to me. Um, right at the end of the table, we have Zahan from Singapore. Um, he's an artist and academic working at the intersections of critical theory and performance. And you might have seen some of his performance work at the Fringe Festival or SIFA or at the Esplanade. Um, he's actually going to be starting with his PhD, so congratulations, um, later, <laughs> later this year, join the club, with a research focus on distended gestures of performative dissidents over time in Singapore. If you want to find out more about his work, you can go to ludzahan.com. Um, <laughs> And next to him, we have Jo Kukutas from Malaysia. Um, you may have very well seen her in various performances in Singapore over the many, many years. Um, she's an actor, writer, and director of the Instant Cafe Theatre Company, where she has created some of her most iconic characters, and she's done numerous one-person shows, um, sometimes written for her. You may have seen her in, for example, also Hosea Suleiman's Occupation, or Wild Rises Hotel, um, various other pieces um, that have been staged across the years, or Atomic Jaya. And next to me, I have Jean Tay from Singapore, um, who is a really prolific playwright, who has written more than 20 plays and musicals, um, which have been performed in Singapore, the US, the UK, and Italy. Um, you may know her from works such as uh, Senang, Sisters, Boom, and Everything But the Brain, which are currently um, literature texts that are taught in secondary schools. And for Everything But the Brain, she also won uh, Best Original Script at the Live Theatre Awards. Um, recently, she's been exploring um, a lot of site-specific and, and, and participatory work, including uh, the performance tour Chinatown Crossings, or recently um, Flowers um, that takes place in a, in a home, and the trilogy, It Won't Be Too Long, the particularly the cemetery dusk where they looked at Bukit Brown um, Cemetery. So the topic that we're, we're looking at um, kind of, it, it's, it's quite a sprawling topic to think of this notion of what what history is, and I think as each of the artists talks more about the work, we'll have more of a sense about what their connection with this project is. Um, I think each of the people here has been working in really diverse ways with notions of um, personal history, private history, political history, public history, performative history, um, and I think they will explore a little bit more about why this matters to them in their approach to, to art and to performance, how they sort of you know, navigate some of the ethical, political, and personal questions that emerge in the process. Um, I think in Singapore particularly, and this feels like a very heavily Singaporean panel um, in the mix of quite an international lineup that we've had, I think um, particular to us, we've had a perpetual fixation about about how we navigate histories that have been given to us, um, how we reclaim them, um, how we, we look at erasure, um, how we look at what we can imagine for a future history, um, and what it means when histories are, are decided upon with particular motivations that result in erasure or bias, and how to rethink these narratives to frame maybe more critical and broader insights about the human condition. Um, and so, yeah, I, I won't. I won't speak too much. I think the in during this first section, um, each of them will explore in their own way the larger notions of why engaging with histories is important in their practice, um, what histories uh, they are engaged in, what their concerns are, how they're used in the arts, what they choose to focus on, um, which ones they avoid, and yeah, various other parts of their personal practices. So we'll start with. Joe. So, yes, thank you. Thank you. 
Hello, everybody. Um, yes, uh, that's me, actor, writer, director, dramaturg. <laughs> um, history of the human condition. I thought it's a really massive topic. And in looking at the idea of the human condition in my work, um, I began to ask myself uh, what I was um, and what we are. And for myself, I wanted to ask, as artists, are we public and political, or are we private and are we individual? So I began to think about the history of my own country and, and my own personal history as well. So my country is 56 years old. It was formed in 1963. Uh, my my theatre company is 30 years old. And when I realised that, I realised some of my characters that I play, which I created 30 years ago, are you know more than half the age of my. Uh, no, my country is only twice as old as some of my characters. So our histories are very interlinked, and I think that's why my work is political, and I'm desperately trying to become more private, but it's impossible. But on a personal level, I am also 56 years old, although I was born actually the year before my country was formed, but I'm not yet 57, so I'm calling myself 56. <laughs> and I'm very interested in these accidents of history, right? And yesterday we were talking about different kinds of dramaturgy, so I began to wonder last night about the dramaturgy of birth. We talked that climate cannot... Um, has, a play, has a place in dramaturgy. So then if climate has a place in dramaturgy, why not the dramaturgy of birth as well? And, and my father was a writer, a journalist, a government critic. Uh, he used to work for the government for Radio TV Malaya, later for the government as a diplomat, um, but very quickly became a critic and a thorn in the side for many people in the government. And the first, thing, first job I had after university was to come and help him edit his book, which was a fiercely anti-government book. So my early education was completely political. And um, even though I studied politics and philosophy, I never thought I was going to enter into the world of theater. I always thought my work would be in journalism or as a writer, and certainly my instincts are very activist, much more than they are theater. Um, theater was another accident of history. Uh, my mother was a teacher, a reader, and I think that's very important for me, and a gardener. Um, and both my parents, uh, their, their, their parents came from Sri Lanka. Uh, so that's my personal history. My, I bring up the gardener because my mother was always planting things in the garden, but that was because that's what her family did as well. When my grandfather cleared the land in Ipoh, he built a house and um, planted lots of trees. And every time one of his 20 children got married, he planted another tree. So the idea of taking root in a country was very important. But I spent a lot of my early years away from my country, and I came back at the age of 21 to find a country that was all about race. And it was a big shock to me um, to be told I wasn't quite the same as everybody else. And it took a long time to... No, I've never negotiated that fact. And so a lot of my work reflects that. It reflects the sense of not belonging and saying, no, I do belong. So. My public history and my private history were therefore collided from a very early age, that the family was deeply political. Um, I grew up thinking in political terms. I grew up thinking also about my extended family and their lives as well. But, but what did I do? I formed a theatre company 30 years ago to do political satire. And the history of my company and the history of my country, I feel, are very interlinked. Things happened because something happened in the country. So in 1987, there was an, um, something called Operation Lalang, which for me was very formative because um, 130 people were arrested and detained without trial. Major newspapers were shut down. My, um, my house, um, what do you call them? Somebody who lived in the house with me was also arrested and detained without trial for two years. My father was on the books, but they did not detain him. Uh, he was really quite aggravated by that, I think, always. Uh, but I think they thought it wasn't a good idea. Uh, and he never really lived it down, <laughs> I think. Uh, so I formed a theatre company and we did political satire uh, because we felt the only way that we could express what we wanted to express was through the venue of comedy and through satire and trying to look at our country that way. So from the start, they were both linked. Um, but a lot of people said, this is not Malaysian culture. Satire is not part of our culture. Um, and I beg to differ. <laughs> I think Wayang Kulit uh, is a subversive art form. With Wayang Kulit, you always have, as you can see there, the Pat Dogols of the world. He is the one who is caught between the tempests of power. And I feel for myself as well, and for my company as satirists, that's who we are. And we represent that character in the Wayang Kulit. Um, and so when people say, it's not your culture, uh, it's not our culture to be satirical, I feel they're just plain wrong. So I've always been interested in these characters in the margins, the ones without power, the powerless. So um, I've always been interested in them, and I think most of the work that I've done over the years has been about um, such stories and such people. So as a political satirist, that's, uh, that's my public self. 
And that's why I tell them about public stories, which are linked to um, larger issues of the nation and national narratives. Um, so uh, this is a show I did four years ago called State of the Nation. Those of you who are Malaysian or Singaporeans who may know what's been happening in Malaysia may know that there was a 2.6 billion donation that was given to our, <laughs> our then Prime Minister. This was um, um, in 2016 that we did this show. And of course, the state of donation was the topic on everyone's lips. But I think the work has always been to ask, what is the state of the nation? And then the question then is, whose story is it? And I had often been made to feel that I had no right to tell the stories of my nation um, or had to tell it in a very marginal form. So I felt, no, the only way then is to actually claim your right to have a place to tell the stories. Um, so I thought, well, whose story is it? And whose, no, God, my spelling's terrible. Whose story is it? Whose history is it? And I thought, if I cannot tell the stories as myself, because I felt I could not, then I began to invent characters. So this is the first character I invented 30 years ago called Ribena Berry. <laughs> <laughs> and Ribena Berry is uh, Chinese, as you can see. And uh, she, because I, I was really annoyed by this notion of race, because everything was always about race and, and, and class. So I created a Chinese beauty queen um, from up north. And uh, she spoke in her own kind of English languages. That's how she speaks. And, but through her, through her very naive voice, um, she spoke a lot of truth about politics because she completely believed everything she, she heard, but she would say it the way she heard it. And through her character, I began, I was able to say very critical things about the government, but say, but she's praising you. She's not saying anything bad about you. She's praising the government through her naivete. Uh, so she was a very useful character for me to be able to say things that otherwise I wouldn't be allowed to say. And it was a time when we were told, basically, you can't say things, you'll get into a lot of trouble. When my company was first started, everybody said it would last a week. Um, and I'm very happy to know that it's still around 30 years later. The second character I created was this guy. Uh, his name is YB. Well, YB is, um, he's a member of parliament. Um, he is a deputy minister. He's been a deputy minister now for 30 years. Uh, but recently, he lost in the last election. So when I talk about these characters, these characters, um, they were created 30 years ago, but they performed for 30 years at various um, times on stage sometimes, in public spaces sometimes. They have opened book, they have launched book, they have launched books, they have opened galleries, they have launched art exhibitions, they have spoken at law dinners, they have their own life. Um, YB even has his Twitter account where he was often roundly abused for some of his views. Um, and now in the last election, he lost his seat. But he's still, no, sorry, he, won his seat, but he's no longer in parliament. He's now a member of the opposition. So he went through a real identity crisis um, because he no longer is in power, but he still has his seat of uh, Ulu Katak, which Malaysians or Malay-speaking Singaporeans will know um, is a... It's a joke. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then these two characters turned up a bit later. Uh, this is Puan Badaria Tudong Priok. She's a government civil service. Um, she's, and she has changed over the years as well. She's also developed. She, I started, when I first created her, it was because I was upset about things within the government bureaucracy. But later I became to under, came to understand who she was. And again, she's taken on her own life. Uh, when I was invited to do a TED talk, I chickened out and Puan Badaria did it for me instead and spoke at this TED talk about interconnectivity. Um, this is Judgmental Singh. He, uh, he appeared um, because of the, of the, um, the trial of our deputy, then Deputy Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. So I needed a, I needed a judge to, to condemn people you know, in, in court. And his opening line for every trial was, you stand accused of sodomy. And it didn't matter what you were on trial for, but you were going to be tried for sodomy, whether you liked it or not. Uh, so I needed him to talk about the legal, what was happening to our justice system. And then I got very tired of all these characters. And I found this character. And she was the one who's in some ways the closest to me. My other characters, I mean, Ch Chinese uh, beauty queen, no. Um, Muslim politician, no. Malay civil servant, no. Uh, Indian judge, well, Indian, but that's it. Um, but Curry Spice was a, not that I look like her either. She was um, in some ways, um, said the things I could, felt I couldn't say. She was the only first character who spoke directly about what she felt. And she basically said, I, I'm a minority, I don't matter in this country, but fuck off, sorry, she's very French. She said basically to the audience, piss off, fuck off, I don't care what you might think because I'm Indian and I matter in the rest of the world because black lives matter. 
So as far as she's concerned, she didn't care about the race politics of the country. But I was also interested in other people's stories, voices from the margins, as I said. So I was a dramaturg <laughs> for a program called First Works, where I created new stories, um, which tackled issues in Malaysia, bullying, homophobia, interracial conflict, um, plays that came out of the Reformasi movement, so adaptations, for example, of accidental death of an anarchist. Um, even when I did much of Venice, it was really about race relations in Malaysia, about justice. And when I looked at, um, when I started doing intercultural work, this is my first pro project I did in Japan, called Pula Antara, or um, the island in between. I was looking at history and memory. So this is a conventional idea of history that I talk about today. Um, but I was very interested in the idea of ghosts um, and, and memory uh, in this play. Pictures, pictures. Um, and we were talking yesterday about human and post-human, that ghosts are not just uh, human, they are also post-human ghosts. Um, and I realized I was very interested in the histories of people, but more interested in the histories of the dead, because the dead really can't speak. And I've always been interested in those who can't speak, but the dead in particular. And so I began to do quite a few plays which involve dead people walking, like this man who is a politician who's now dead, comes back to haunt his family, uh, full of regrets. Um, this um, transsex transvestite um, sex worker who is dead because she's murdered by a schoolboy, um, but she comes back to find justice as well. And then I made a big departure um, and went into a series called Almost True Stories because I'd always shied away from telling any personal stories. My work was always political, the stories were always political. And then um, after my mother passed away, I started finding myself wanting to write her story or our story and I couldn't bring myself to do it because I'm quite private and I don't like to put them out there. Um, and I was trying to write a play about something else and my mother kept intruding until finally I had no choice but to write a story about her. And this has began my incursion into writing my more private stories. Um, and I call them almost true stories because of course they are not quite true. But this began the kind of more personal stories. Um, I'm a Sri Lankan migrant family um, and in the first play I did called Silence Please, it was a personal story, but I couldn't help but bringing the political into it. Because at the same time that this was happening, there was a lot of incidences in Malaysia of body snatching, uh, meaning that people who were discovered uh, at their death to, to have been Muslim, because they converted at some point, were taken away from the home at the day, on the day of the burial. It was very traumatic. So I began to imagine what it might be like for me if on the day of my mother's death, I suddenly discovered she had been she'd converted to Islam for some reason, and on some certificate uh, she was seen as Muslim. So I had nightmares about her being taken away before I had a chance to bury her body, and this piece came out of that. Um, so again, the, the, personal kept cut, the political kept coming into the personal. Um, and other migrants also appeared into the play um, to tell their stories as well, like the neighbors um, of this family in, the, in this play. Um, and then I just went into very personal stories, and um, this play was, uh, based on um, a very personal um, story in my family, and I turned it into a play again about migration, migrants, um, people who don't belong, who travel the globe now, uh, looking for, for, um, for something. So in this case, Raj and his uncle traveled to New York to try to find hope. Um, it coincides with a terrible tragedy um, along the way, but I realized that I was coming closer to the idea of the eye <laughs> Uh, in my stories, quite literally, sometimes. Um, now I want to go back a bit to the history of the fictional characters. So these are, I mean, these are five of the characters that I've played. I, 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 I connect the, these five because these are the ones who I've played many times over the years. The other characters I've played kind of one-off. But these characters keep coming back and they really have their own life. Um, people find it strange, I always talk about them in the third person, but I do feel that they are quite outside myself and they are, they, 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 they turn up because they are needed for something. And I use them and they come to me and say, uh, I'll do it. For example, with a TED talk or um, in the past um, at, at a law conference, uh, I had to go and speak and I felt I couldn't do it. So YB went and spoke instead uh, at the law conference. It was much more interesting. I think he's a much more confident person than I am. Uh, Judgmental Singh went to open an exhibition once uh, of work where um, judges' wigs were made out of cow dung <laughs> um, by, by a Malaysian artist. And most recently I did a show called The May Ninth Show, which featured these two characters. And The May Ninth Show is a reflection of last year's uh, watershed elections, uh, the May Ninth elections last year when, after 60 years, we had a change of government in the country. 
And um, a lot of my work has been done in the past, has been very oppositional. And it was very strange for me to suddenly find myself on the winning side. And it was very hard for YB to suddenly discover he's on the losing side. And hard for me to try to get him to speak. Um, but he did eventually. And in this play, or in this show rather also, um, YB, um, he's now not in power anymore. He, however, is, has plans to run in the next general election for prime minister, and he plans to win. Um, and Curry Spice, my character from Central, uh, who's a bisexual Indian woman from Central, and Central is a very working class area, large, or used to be a very working class area, she's also announced her candidacy to run for the next general election. So she's gonna start her campaign trail. And I'm gonna see what's, how that pans out in the, next, in, in the run up to the next general election. I might well do it. And also in this show, what I tried to do was to break down the barriers between um, what is real and what was not real. Um, every night we had um, important, we had guests uh, join us on the show. Uh, the show was in the format of a talk show. So um, YB was being interviewed about his plans for the future. Carrie Spice was interviewed about her, her manifesto for a better Malaysia by becoming the next prime minister of the country. And we invited various activists and politicians. So for example, Ambigas Srinivasan was, used to be the chairperson of Bursae, uh, human rights activist. Uh, North Florida is a woman who leads the GE25, GE who's very critical of the government. People like uh, these two below are um, now ministers in the new government. Um, um, activists, uh, trans, trans um, activists, uh, women's rights activists, and the last picture is Claire Rucastle Brown, who broke the big story about the 1MDB crisis in Malaysia, and the editor of Malaysia, Kini, who have been, who's very instrumental again in creating change in Malaysia. So I want to have a conversation with these change makers, <laughs> but this time from YB was having the conversation from the point of somebody who had lost, and it was very hard for him actually. I mean, the two people in the in the last slide kept on saying to him, we're not going to talk to you because you should be in jail. And it was very difficult for, me to hear, for him to hear that. He wasn't used to people not being respectful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is Carrie Spice, and um, she has her womanifesto for GE15, and this platform was a platform for her to say to the audience what her manifesto was, and to get people to join her, um, to ca help ca her campaign uh, under the banner of Ini Karila. Uh, <laughs> which if you're Malaysian, you will also have some inkling of what that might mean. Um, so that was the main ninth show. But with all my characters, I think um, many years ago, I was part of a Asian um, collaboration of six nations, uh, trying to do a collaborative play called Hotel Grand Asia. And the dramaturg was, um, one of the dramaturgs rather, was a historian called Sumit Mandal. And when we were trying to write this piece, he said to us, or create this piece, he said to us, these are historical narratives of the nation, but actually they're all fictions anyway. Right? The nation is a fiction. So all you need to do is create your own fiction. And I think that's what I've been trying to do since, just to create my own fiction, uh, my own realities. Um, because if you don't give me a place within the nation, I will just take one anyway and say this is as real as anything that you are proposing to me, um, which is what I've tried to do. Um, and Curry Spice's um, womanifesto, <laughs> basically ends with the idea of the nation is anything you want it to be, you just have to imagine it. And, um, and I think in finishing off, um, perhaps looking at this idea here of um, histories, that um, your history is, I mean, my history is for me what I have to make of it. That I think in a country like Malaysia, which is a very new country, um, where people were trying to build it from the very beginning, and I see my, in my parents their attempts to build the country, then I think we are also part of that idea of building it. And as an artist, I feel I build it through this fiction, uh, which hopefully will, can become real. Thank you very much, Joe. I think Joe's work has really given a sense of how the fictional can a very strong claim over a very long period of time, not just a kind of one-off event, but these characters cultivated, these emissaries, I guess, of your personal and, and, and political life um, over a span of 30 years have creating their own very intricate um, yeah, sense of, of personal identity that, that form a history that is very much accurate uh, portrayal of everything that's happened within those, those few decades. Um, we're moving on to Zihan, who will look at a real person's life and the histories that spiral out from this, this fulcrum of a person um, in without. 
Uh, actually, that's a great segue because we're talking about like fictional imagination, versioning of histories. Uh, I have a short preamble, then I'm going to talk briefly about two productions I did, if I have time. If not, I'll just stick to without. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to read from my preamble first, and then I'm going to show a few photos of without for those people who haven't seen or heard about the work before. Uh, and then I'm going to make some remarks on the production itself. Uh, so just expanding and staying on topic, uh, uh, this is my response to the, to, the, to the questions that were sent out earlier as part of this panel. Uh, very much like Joe, I, I think, especially in Singapore, from a Singaporean perspective, our histories have always been instrumentalized by the state and used to further like a singular determined narrative in Singapore. There's, it's almost, yeah, there, there's no alternative perspective that is tolerated and even more so with current political developments around <laughs> POFMA and protection of online falsehoods. It's this consolidation of power to a singular figure or singular figures, in a way, in the, within the cabinet. Uh, and I see the role of an artist or a theatre maker or you know, somebody who's producing work in Singapore as providing alternatives and to, most importantly, inculcate a sense of criticality in the viewer or the reader or the audience. Uh, in my perspective, there are different, different strategies of achieving this criticality. Uh, and I've adopted some strategies of allowing the audience or the reader or the viewer to pay attention to the minute or the everyday or the mundane uh, in one of my work or some of my works. At the same time, also providing them with a sort of paradigm shift in think thinking through envisioning collectively a counterfactual history or a counterfactual kind of imagined future. Uh, and I'm not the only one who's doing this. Another person that comes to mind would be Sunny Liu's uh, Art of Charlie Chang Hot Chai and also Necessary Stages production like Manifesto. Uh, this collective utilizing of uh, art, in a way, to, to, to imagine what is not permitted to be imagined, or seen, or heard. Um, most importantly for myself, also linked to my practice as an educator, it comes in the form of investigating how information is transmitted, and how it is consumed in theatre, and it's linked to Martin's observation about the theatre space itself as an infrastructure that you know, stultifies, to use a Ransarian term, uh, the audience into a kind of way of absorbing information. So in a way, both productions that I'm talking about today resist and refuse and try to jolt the reader or the viewer or the audience out of a way of consuming theatre. Uh, in a way, some people would call it participation, which is this word that has been floating around today, uh, that sort of have negative connotations, but in a way, it is a strategy of allowing them to think beyond the ways of consuming information that they have been so uh, indoctrinated with since their years in the education system. Uh, okay, and also somewhat linked to my thesis, uh, that I'm going to do, and hopefully I survive doing. Um, the grounding question for my research is, how do we calibrate our relationship to performance and theatre and move it beyond an obsession or fetishization of the here and the now and the event? Okay, do I have to repeat that again? Yeah. <laughs> how do we recalibrate our relationship to performance and theatre? beyond the here and the now and the event. So beyond that two hours or two hours and 15 minutes, uh, yeah. How do we move beyond that to talk about things uh, and to imagine performance beyond that frame? How can we extend it, extrapolate on that? So a performance that lasts like 10 years or a gesture that is completed within two weeks. Yeah. So this, in, in a way, I'm thinking about examining gestures distended over longer trajectories of time and turning our attention to the gesture of archiving and collecting information as a quiet revolutionary gesture. 
which is especially necessary under illiberal regimes, where we are not permitted to protest or assemble like more than one person in Hong Lim Park with a permit and a license. You know, uh, if we are not allowed to perform conventional modes of protest and revolution, how can protest and revolution still happen? Over time, distended, extended uh, in different ways, in different forms. So the two productions I'll be talking about today have been an experiment personally in reconfiguring or disrupting a relationship and with the viewer and a disorientation of sorts in order for the viewer to reorientate themselves and to reanimate their relationship to the fetish of the life and once again inculcate and encourage a sense of criticality. Okay, uh, the preamble is a bit long, so I'm going to jump into the work. Um, the first work I'm going to talk about is Without. Um, how many of you have seen it? Just a show of hands. How many of you have heard of it? Just a show of hands. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit more context to explain. So, Without is actually based on Completely Without Character, which is a production that was staged by The Necessary Stage in 1999 featuring a uh, monologue performed and written in collaboration with Harish Sharma and Alvin Tan uh, by Paddy Chu, who is the first person in Singapore to come out publicly as living with HIV. This was in 1998-1999. The performance was in 1999. Uh, and he passed away in August of 1999, shortly after the performance. Um, so, in a way, uh, my gesture that and intent was to archive the piece first and foremost. So I went into TNS archives and I dug through the material and I found some video uh, documentation that survived. Uh, and I decided to use the material, reconfigure it. I presented a first draft version for it in 2015 as part of the Singapore Fringe Festival at Centre 42. And after that, I continued to develop it uh, on the invitation of Espanay into a piece that uh, I roped in performer Janice Cole uh, to re-perform uh, Paddy's words and using technological headphones, infrastructure, and other headphone play in a way uh, uh, we, to revisit this documentation. So I'm just going to show a short clip from, uh, that contains several production stills and also Janice introducing the production and it will give some context. Uh, remember, you walk into the theatre space at Esplanade Theatre Studio. Uh, it's a piece where you, it's like a promenade piece where you can walk around and sit wherever you want to. You have you are given a pair of headphones with three different channels on it, and Janice will talk about it later. And this introduction is playing on the headphones, uh, and I'm going to show like some production stills so that you can see how the production looked like. You are watching the first of 12 scenes from Completely Without Character. This monologue was performed by Paddy Chu and devised in collaboration with Alvin Tan and Harish Sharma from The Necessary Stage. For those of us in the theatre space, you have been given a wireless headset and there are three audio channels that you can choose from. This channel you are listening to is the first audio channel and it will feature my live performance of the script. The second channel is documentation of Paddy's performance in 1999. The third channel is a mix of both first and second channels. We are also streaming tonight's performance live on our Facebook page. There will be a question and answer session in the middle of the performance, and we invite questions from both the theater audience and those joining us online. For those in the theatre space, you are welcome to move around and to experience the performance from various vantage points. If you are listening to this, please consider shifting to a different position now. Harish and Elvin were looking to interview HIV-positive individuals in preparation for a production in June 1998, and they were introduced to Paddy. 
During the interview process, Paddy spoke with so much vigor and passion that Harish and Elvin decided to continue talking to him. They spoke about the possibility of creating a play about Paddy's life. In August 1998, Elvin and Harish spent a few months interviewing Paddy. They would meet once or twice a week, either at Paddy's or at Elvin's place. Sometimes they would spend the whole afternoon just watching television together over food and drinks. At the end of the interview process, they took a break and Harish started structuring the interview content into a monologue. Paddy decided to come out publicly with his HIV status at the first Singapore AIDS conference in December 1998. The version that you will hear me perform tonight is the version that Harish wrote. Paddy, Harish and Alvin began rehearsals on this script. Over the rehearsal process, Paddy would continue to embellish and improvise the way he told his life story. So the eventual version he performed in May 1999 is captured in the video documentation that you are watching. This documentation was edited by Zihan from different recordings of the performance. Like how Harish structured Paddy's words, Zihan tried to assemble the most potent version of Paddy's performance in this documentation. Tonight, we invite you to experience these versions of Completely Without Character and to consider the gap that lies between them. Okay, so that's kind of like the preamble. If you don't really get it, I'll break it down for you again. There are different multiple versions of the same script that survives. So every night in the documentation of the three or four nights that Paddy performs it, it's a different way of presenting. He breaks down at different points in the play based on his own life experience. He, he sometimes uh, like rambles or to go off tangent and comes back to the script. Uh, and for the longest time, when I wanted to do research and archival into the production, uh, I would be given Harish's version. And I didn't know that there was a different version that actually existed until I went through the documentation. So as an archivist or as a theatre maker, the most fascinating bits for me was the gap between Harish's version, which they started rehearsal with, which is this very tight version that Janice performed that night live. Uh, and it's dramatized, uh, uh, and versus the documentation version. And the discrepancy can be sometimes, so that evening at, at Esplanade, uh, the documentation will be playing on screen, scene by scene, 12 scenes, and Janice will perform it in cadence. And sometimes Janice would finish two, three minutes before Paddy's documentation finished, because basically that's Harish script. The script has run out. So for the, for the last two or three minutes, she'll be watching the television or she'll be watching alongside the audience. And also the added factor of the headphones, because Martin will ask, it's like, how does it add to the world of the play in the technological elements? So it allows for Janice to take on a really different way of emoting and expressing the language that Harish wrote and it allowed for really, really intimate moments of confession, which is what Paddy's pr production is about, like a confession and leaving behind a statement, a confession of sorts. So it allows for that confessional performance and a very intimate way of revealing information to the listener and the viewer. Yeah. Uh, What's the time now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe I'll pause, then give to Jane, then I'll come back and talk about Ketamite. Uh, wait, before, just to segue or so. Uh, so, uh, from Joe, thinking about Paddy, you know, it's about how do we transmute a private memory into a very public kind of performance of history, in a way. Uh, and specifically to without, and also thinking of Joe, how do we shed new light on histories that are already written or pre-written, even before we stepped into this world? Um, how do we allow and we permit this knowledge to continue to flow from generation to generation? So we as the conduit or the carriers or the custodians of this information. And what can a memorial gesture or a gesture of memor memorializing or commemoration look like? 
how can it be alternative to these state monuments and these gestures that are over the top and grand? Yeah, how can it be a quiet way and a quiet strategy of memorializing and remembering? And most importantly, how do we challenge the convention and liveness of theatre? And how do we conjure up the haunting of another being or a haunting of the scepter of another production? Okay, with that, I'll pass to Jean. Thank you very much, Zahan, for that presentation. Um, I like the, the, I've been thinking a lot about um, how it is that we encounter work over a long temporal um, period of time and how long a performance actually exists for. Is it just the event of the performance or are we still in performance for as long you know, prior to the work? That Sarah, Sarah Bei Ching talks about uh, performance as a mode rather than a singular event, such that your point of entry could be any time you begin looking for tickets to every conversation you have subsequently or the kind of uh, revisitations that you have with the work um, after. And I think, yeah, it was a really nice segue that now we'll look at also Jean's uh, body of work that sometimes deals quite explicitly with these narratives uh, of the state and these memorializations and monuments that, that the state has and how she moves around them. So, Jean. Thanks so much, and thanks so much, Joe and Suhan, for sharing. I, th I thought it was just really lovely to hear what you shared, and, and just to find so many resonances, and I think it echoes of, I think, what we're all trying to do in different ways, yeah. Um, uh, so, first, an apology. I Sorry, I don't have any slides. I'm just going to talk, and you have to use your imagination. I have an excuse for that. Uh, as I was thinking about it, then I realized that actually the reason why I don't have slides is because, um, I guess as a writer, as a playwright, my work is my text. So when it gets to the production stage and those beautiful production stills and shots that you get, actually I never quite feel that that's my own. Uh, I mean, I, I, it's either like my memories, you know, that kind of thing, but it, it's never quite my, my material to present. And it's not very exciting to present you with a bunch of text anyway. So, <laughs> if you don't mind, I will just share, I think, some of my experiences that I've, um, I guess, as a writer, um, and I guess a bit of my journey as a writer, uh, and, and exploring stories. Um, and, uh, yeah, from, I guess, over a rather long period of time. Uh, and just, I thought it was, it was really lovely um, how uh, Joe was sharing that for you, your journey was from from public political to personal, and mine has been actually quite the opposite. And I always, I, I, I still do, I, I resist, uh, I, I say I'm not a political writer, although some people disagree with me, uh, but I always think of myself as a personal, um, I, I come from a personal point of view, and, and that's how I started telling stories. Uh, so, you know, as a schoolgirl in secondary school, when I tell stories, they are always about young Chinese women, you know, with my kind of background. And, um, and I think when I first started writing plays, uh, uh, I wrote about my own experiences because that was what I knew. I wrote about my grandmother extensively. I wrote like two or three plays about her to get her out of my system. Um, I'm often asked why, you know, what where do I find inspiration? And, uh, and I think I find inspiration from stories. Uh, I can't tell you, it's a very gut feel kind of thing, but there are certain stories that get under my skin. I can't quite forget them. You know, there's something, something powerful about stories, right? That there's something weird or creepy or scary or whatever that, or disturbing or, or, or beautiful that, that, that affects me. And I get that story under my skin. And sometimes I have a chance to tell it immediately and I can. Um, so, so sometimes it's from a discomfort, for example, with my grandmother, it's uh, uh, not being able to communicate with her and yet being her own flesh and blood and yet having that disconnect with her. And I think writing was a way of expressing that. Um, but I think at, at the same time, it, it's also, yeah, so, so sometimes it, 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 it's a different process and sometimes those stories are not my own, uh, but they affect me in a certain way. And so when I write, it is a way of processing those emotions that it stirs in me. Um, so I guess I will talk about my own journey as a writer in about three or actually four stages. Right? So the first stage uh, was when I was a bit younger and I think a lot of my stories and plays were inspired by personal experiences, uh, young women, you know, dealing with their grandmothers and, and issues like that. Um, and then uh, after that, 
you know, and, and so, a, so a play like Everything But The Brain, which I wrote about a daughter uh, taking care of her, her ailing uh, father who had suffered from a stroke, and it was about the theory of relativity. And it was very much about my own fears of, um, you know, what would happen if I would have to become the caregiver for my father, and what would happen if, you know, I would have to deal with a loved one, you know, suffering from this kind of situation and, you know, wanted to turn back time. So it's a very personal approach, uh, which I kind of melded with, you know, relativity and fairy tales, um, because I like fairy tales and myths. Um, and then later on, uh, as I continued to explore uh, different stories, uh, I realized that um, I became quite interested in stories that were a bit further back in time. So some undiscovered stories, right? So you, you explore all the obvious ones, the ones that are close to the surface first. Uh, but then after that, it was like, oh, okay, what are these stories I haven't heard yet, right? So one of these first pieces was actually a play called Sisters. Uh, it was approached by uh, a, a, a director, Jeffrey Tan, uh, and it was actually produced here uh, in the Arts House. And it was uh, about the Sisters Islands, which are offshore islands um, in, in the south of Singapore. And uh, they're a pair of small islands. There is a myth about their founding, about a pair of sisters uh, who, who drowned and were turned into islands when they were being pursued by a pirate. And, uh, but there's also a history of, um, of a crime that was committed there in 1963 when uh, this man, Sunny Ang, was uh, accused of drowning his girlfriend there, and it was uh, on a diving trip because the currents there are very uh, treacherous, and she was a first-time swimmer and diver. Uh, so, but all the evidence was circumstantial, and uh, yeah, and, and so it was that story that was set in 1963, an actual uh, historical event uh, that was covered at length by the press in the 60s. But by the time we started to explore it in, you know, 2000, early 2000s, it was about 50 years later, and this story had pretty much all but been erased uh, from, I guess, from national consciousness, you know. Uh, but if you ask my parents, my parents' generation, you ask them who Sunny Ang is, they all, they all know the guy, but not my current generation. I thought, okay, that's, that's interesting that this history, uh, that we, or this story that we once, you know, that we once shared, uh, is no longer being explored or discussed. And uh, so what happens when you bring it to stage and you share it with an audience that is both young and old? And it was very interesting because we had, I had you know, uh, more mature audiences telling me, oh, I remember the story. And, but we also had young girls who could identify with the story of you know, young sisters and they felt for it emotionally. Uh, so that play, Sisters, brought me to another play called Senang, uh, which was... Uh, about the prison riots on Pulau Senang, uh, which was an offshore uh, penal colony um, in, in Singapore in uh, the 1960s also. And coincidentally, in 1963, uh, a, a riot took out, a, a, a mutiny? A mutiny took, out, took place there and where the, where the detainees on this island actually uh, rebelled uh, against the, the Irishman who was, uh, it was colonial, it was a colonial government at that time, so the Irishman was running the place and they rebelled, they burnt down all, everything they built, you know, uh, yeah, in a few hours, they built over three years, they built reservoirs, they built dormitories, uh, everything, generators and, and all that, and everything was burnt down, they killed four prison wardens, including um, this Irish man, uh, Daniel Dutton, and uh, reportedly they gouged out his eyes and set him on fire and only his boots were left. So it was a very dramatic piece of uh, history that nobody seems to know about either and I certainly never knew about until I started doing research on sisters. And again, I thought, why is this, you know, why is this history no longer being spoken about? Or why is it, uh, you know, it's completely buried. And, Perhaps part of it is because really everything is so marginalized that it's really taken place offshore. It's all pushed, all these stories are all pushed off the island, literally. Um, and, and they've been buried. So these are literally buried histories. And I thought, you know, but, you know, why would they do something like that? You know, what would have caused men to turn on each other, to turn on this guy and, you know, do something like that? So, so that was my exploration into Senang. 
Um, and I guess later on, if that's t there's time, I will talk about my challenges in writing this play because I did not want to write this play. I didn't think I was capable of writing this play set in the 60s about a bunch of gang gangsters because I'm neither man nor have been imprisoned in the 60s. So, you know, I can't come at it from a personal point of view, which is usually how I write. Uh, so how do I then enter these characters' lives? How do I create a vivid characters or, or, or even, you know, semi-authentic characters and you know, everyone from that period pretty much uh, had, had passed on or, you know, was hanged as a result of, you know, that, that episode. So, so I can share a bit more about my experiences uh, or challenges in putting up that play later. Um, so those were two of my island plays and I thought, oh great, I love the islands and I'm, I'll explore one more. And I, there was an island that I was actually very fascinated with, St. John's Island, uh, which used to be... Uh, uh, I guess a quarantine site uh, for lepers, and I think for TB also, if I'm not wrong. Um, so I was fascinated by that history, but also in 1963, so everything exciting took place in 1963, offshore, <laughs> you know, off Singapore. Uh, also in 1963, um, there, were, uh, there, was, uh, there were political detainees who were brought to this island, and I just thought this idea of quarantining the people that were believed to be a danger or um, contagious in some way, whether, you know, it was another hundred years back and containing the lepers or containing these people with dangerous ideas offshore I could somehow protect, you know, everyone else. And I, I thought that was a great idea. I would love to write that play too. And then it would be a beautiful trilogy, you know, of island plays. Uh, and I struggled a lot with that play. I mentioned that play, but I've never actually completed that play. So this is actually a failed play of mine. Um, and I can also talk about that later. Because I think the failures are sometimes interesting, right? Why, why couldn't I write this play? And parts of that play actually eventually ended up in a different play of mine. So never, nothing's really wasted. But uh, I think there was a reason why I struggled so much with it. Uh, so that was kind of stage two, where I started to explore the histories of, um, of individuals who were different from me. And, uh, and I think tr but trying to still access it from a personal point of view, but albeit one that was very different from my own. Uh, and then later, as I continued to work with uh, different theatre companies, and in particular, I started working more with uh, a theatre company called uh, Drama Box. So they do a lot of community theatre and site-specific work, and they work a lot with uh, communities. And, uh, and through them, I started working with communities as well. I started becoming interested in the history of communities. And um, the f one of the first pieces I did with them was uh, a piece called Ignolin of My Time, uh, about Bukit Ho Swee. And uh, again, Bukit Ho Swee is an old housing estate in Singapore that is most famous for uh, having, you know, it, was, it used to be a kind of a slummy area that suffered the worst fire ever in Singapore uh, in 1961. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my history is like uh, too many numbers. So, yeah, so, so I was fascinated by that event in history. But at the same time, uh, I think we were also very interested to explore what were the memories of the current residents, or past and present residents uh, of that place. And so what we did was we, we conducted many interviews uh, with, with, with different residents who were both living there, but also who had already left. And um, I think what was very interesting was that we figured there was, you know, we were like, oh, what happened during the fire? You know, do you know what happened? You know, what was the, you know, some people said, oh, the, ba the, the baker, it was the baker's house and it, it, the, the oven caught fire or something. But there were other conspiracy theories or not so, and, and to some of them, it, they were not conspiracy theories. They were like, a man came into the village and he, they, you know, a few men came in and they threw, you know, lighted pieces of, you know, material, you know, and it basically set the place on fire. And then there were other versions that were these, were not just any men, these were government men. And this was the best way for the government to actually clear the slum and to, you know, start then on a, this, this uh, to, to rebuild from scratch because it was, uh, I mean, to some people it was home, but to others it was kind of a cesspool of, you know, crime and, and, uh, and a slum and it was not a very desirable place. So it was interesting to piece, to, to figure out, to piece all these stories together. And eventually what we created was uh, a prominent theatre uh, piece that took 
the audience through different areas of uh, Bukit Ho Sui and um, uh, with actors. Uh, one actor was, was the, the tour guide, so to speak, and there was another actor who was clearly acting a role, so she was acting as a ghost. Um, and, uh, but we also had other participants who were the actual uh, members of the community uh, take part at various points and they actually shared their own uh, recollections of the space, of their communities, of what it was like to live there and to be relocated, and, you know, and their sense of dislocation. So that was Bukit Ho Sui. Um, another similar piece that I did um, uh, last year also with Drama Box, and in a different community was Chinatown Crossings, and we are restaging that uh, this year. Um, and it was, again, similar, and actually this, was com this, was, this piece was commissioned or, or, or seeded by the, the STB, which is the Singapore Tourism Board. So, so uh, the sense was that, okay, we have to be very proper about this, right? And, you know, nothing too uh, subversive or... or but, um, you know, we're artists and we're like, okay, we have to do a piece that, um, that we really care about, I think. And, and in the first place, you know, to do a piece in Chinatown, um, or as it was originally called, Krita Aya or Ngao Che Sui, um, but in English, because it was targeted at tourists, um, was a challenge because we were like, okay, how can we authentically find a narrator who would speak English in this space? place, right? And um, I, you know, you don't have a Samsui woman to say, hey, hi, everybody, my name is whatever, and come and follow me. Um, yeah, so no lah. Uh, so, so we, uh, so I think, in, but in thinking about the area and exploring the area more deeply, we realized that there was this real diversity of, um, of cultures in Chinatown. And, um, and there's a beautiful, uh, there's a beautiful, uh, Actually, Singapore's oldest uh, Indian temple, Sri Mariman Temple, is there, and it's right next to um, a, a mosque, which was also built by Indian Muslims, and also very historical sites. And uh, and then we realized actually there were um, there were other inhabitants in in Chinatown that were not Chinese, and whose voices have not necessarily been heard very often. And we thought. Um, and so we decided, okay, we, will, we would take on the voice of uh, uh, an, an Indian man who grew up in Chinatown. And, uh, and yes, there are, you know, this person does exist. Uh, and so there, there were a few, not many, but there were a few um, uh, who did uh, actually spend their childhood in Chinatown. And, um, and I found this particular archival, um, archival recording, this transcripts of, of this man who grew up in Chinatown. And... Um, the passion with which he spoke about this place was extremely inspiring. And, but what I remember, and he refused to move out, you know, even after he grew up and had his own kids, he only literally moved out when the roof fell in on him. And then he was like, okay, I think it's time to go. Uh, and, uh, what was I? yeah, so, so I think capturing his, his, trying to capture his voice and his experiences was, uh, was, a, was a challenge. Um, but yeah, Okay, and, uh, oh, okay, the thing I remember that he kept saying was, I wish I could bring them back, you know, these old residents of Chinatown. He had, there was such a, a, a sense of longing um, and, and loss um, about this place that is now completely transformed uh, from the Chinatown of the 60s and 70s uh, that he felt so passionately about. So, so we wrote, I, I mean, I wrote a piece that, you know, covered two, three different periods in history uh, from, this, from the 60s, 70s to uh, I think the mid 80s, was, which was when the area was officially renamed Chinatown by, you know, the authorities and the present. And uh, yeah, and, so, and the, so the subtitle of that piece is actually called um, Bringing Home the Ghosts. Because I thought that, yeah, and you know, you guys have both mentioned ghosts and hauntings in so many ways. And, and I think a lot of that is, is about how do you create these, how do you give voice to these ghosts? How do you recreate their presence, um, uh, whether through, through, through live performance or through archives or, you know, in, in other forms? Um, So I think we'll, we'll pause here for a little moment so we can maybe address a deeper question to each of the, the panelists and they can go a little bit further from what they've 
already shared kind of as an introduction to their bodies of work. Um, and I, I think I'm really interested so far in, in, I think I see a lot of resonance in the way Jean and Sahan look at this enormous archival historical corpus of work. You're entering into this kind of research where you have to do large interpretive functions and, and looking at an, an archive or, or a period of documented history in whatever form, whether it's oral or on paper, and having to piece together and have a very interpretive function as an artist, gathering materials. And often when you see evidence, I mean, the story could be could be put together in an infinite number of permutations. You know, how do you um, look at this mass of information that's provided to you in the archive and then um, look at the materiali materiality of the, the things that are presented to you, whether they're objects or, or documents, and how does this come to then inform your work? How do you, I suppose, dramaturg all these pieces that are provided to you? And I thought maybe, Zan, we could start with you. You could talk a bit about uh, perhaps Katamite. Yeah. Yes. Oops. Sorry. Wrong one. Uh, I close this? Okay, this will do. Um, so basically, Ketama is my most recent production. And the reason why I wanted to bring it into this conversation uh, is because we've been talking about excavating histories and speaking on behalf of the dead. But I'm also, while working through archives, constantly struggling with the ethical repercussions and implications of speaking for and on behalf of, uh, especially for people who cannot speak back or people who cannot tell you that they do not want their stories represented. Uh, in particular, to my own personal practice as excavating queer narratives and queer memory, this, this real struggle, you know, it's like, when is it an invasion of privacy? You know, when is it that private lives are forcibly made public against one's will? Uh, and how do we negotiate with what thrives in being invisible and what insists on refusing representation? Especially because of the social stigma that pervades the disclosure of one's sexuality in Singapore due to very real legal laws, you know, 377A in place, and it's still in place, that criminalizes homosexual sex, consensual homosexual sex between two adult men. So, and what does it mean when we come to wrestle with objects in the archive? Because everything in the archive has been permitted to survive. And if we only allow ourselves to excavate the memories that survive, are we doing an injustice to those that cannot be permitted to survive or are actively suppressed, that are not within the National Archive? How do we represent and address these narratives? Um, yeah, so this operating within this liminal and pay attention to the liminal. So Katamite is basically um, a lecture performance for 20 audience members. And it takes on a pedagogical classroom format. It's presented earlier this year, commissioned by the Singapore Fringe Festival. Uh, the critical spine that I'm basing my research on was phenomenology, specifically queer phenomenology. And in other words, object-oriented ontology. How do we pay attention to objects that are ever-present and surround our everyday presence in a way? How do we, how do we address uh, what these objects are doing to our corporeal being and how we justify our own existence. Um, so it takes that as the launching pad specifically because I was inspired. So I invite the 20 audience members in and I get them. You can do this as a mental exercise. You lay out everything that you have with you today on the floor and then you select an object that would be an evidence for an existence. It can be your existence, it can be a non-human existence, uh, as long as it's representative of an existence. And collectively, the 20 audience members would come together and we would assemble a temporary archive that would represent us as a collective for that day. So, yeah. And what inspired that particular gesture 
is the research I did when I visited Australia on uh, uh, artist residency in 2015. And I visited the Australian Lesbian Gay Archive, which is a community archive. And there they collected objects from the queer community that were donated. And I was wondering, and this is hypothetically going on to the human futures and human histories, hypothetically what a queer archive, if it was permitted to survive and thrive in Singapore, what would it look like? What sort of objects would it collect? What belongs in a queer archive, queer Singaporean archive? And this was the installation I did in 2015 in response to that hypothetical reimagining. So I sent out an open call for the queer community to send in their objects and I collected them and I displayed them uh, and in an installation. So I had 81 objects from various people within the queer community. But it's exactly this gesture that reminded me that in this gesture of collecting in an archive, I'm only representing what people are allowing to be visible. That there are still a lot of people who are not captured in this archive because they either are in fear or are are uh, uh, uncomfortable with their, their presence being declared in such a very public way. So it's still a very skewed representation of the queer community in Singapore. And with Ketamite, I was specifically honing in and zeroing in on one particular object as a way of thinking about what other potential narratives lie in all the other 80 objects. So through zoning in, zoning in on one object, and telling the multiple narratives that it potentially contains. How do we imagine the potential of all the other objects within this archive? Um, okay, uh, quick, quick, quick. Okay. Uh, so there's a, there's a critical frame that accompanies this exhibition and I'm gonna read it for you now. Uh, and this is the room uh, description that accompanies this installation called Queer Objects and Archive for the Future. And the description goes, the year is 2065. The nation is celebrating SG 100. Section 377A of the Penal Code has been repealed. The first transgender member of parliament was elected to represent the Aljunit constituency at the last general elections. The Ministry of Human Rights and the Community Archive are organizing an exhibition of objects from a time capsule buried 25 years ago. And this is a selection of 81 objects from that time capsule. So we are moving into the futures part, uh, imagine futures. Uh, and specifically the object that I was looking at is this object. I'm going to pass it around. Please be very careful uh, so you can look at it. So it's a watch that is one of these 81 objects. And it's this particular watch. I'm going to read a passage from Katamite, the script that I performed. Here is where we arrive at the temporal centerpiece. This Casio watch with a black strap was one of the objects contributed by Casey to Queer Objects and Archive for the Future. Time is arrested at 5 minutes and 21 seconds past 6 o'clock. This is Casey's account of the narrative of the object from our email correspondence. And quote, this was the first gift I received from my father when I entered Raffles Institution in 1974. So this watch would have been with me for around 45 years. This present from my father was rather precious to me. I wore it every day until the strap broke. And this was also around the time when my father passed away. I left the watch without a strap in my cabinet for years. After I met Chen Sin in 1994, we both decided to live together. He would occasionally clean up my barang barang. He saw this watch and went to search for a new strap, fixed it, and replaced the battery. And the watch had a new life, and I gifted this watch to Chen Sin. Unquote. So Casey prefaced our exchange by stating that his, quote, memory capacitors are so limited these days. Not only do I notice that the capacity is reduced, I think my memory becomes more and more unreliable, like a creature that loves to run on its own creative spin. Unquote. So beyond the fictional premise of a queer time capsule for the future, I begin to think about the potential of imagining multiple narratives for these objects held within a temporary archive. 
And will this strategy allow us to gravitate towards things that are often placed out of reach of queer bodies and across different temporalities? How do we speculate and preserve things that are conditionally not permitted to survive through an act of constantly turning things over time? So let us begin again to remember to forget, to turn time and reset our engagement with these objects of study. And here is where the production goes into like bisection mode. So it's bisected and the second half of this production we actually examine a trial from 1942, which is one of the first high-profile trials uh, in British colonial court, where 377A was introduced and enforced. And a staff officer, a British staff officer, was caught having a relationship with a young male prostitute. And the male prostitute stole the watch uh, because you know, his expectations of remuneration was not met. And this watch became evidence in a trial between this colonial officer and the young boy. And so it's reimagining a different narrative, potential narrative for this watch, and a duplicitous narrative of sorts that is intended to be fictional. But then, at the end of the production, we turn and we examine the objects that we have assembled and we reimagine different narratives for these objects. So that's tangibly uh, how I'm trying to work through this. Yeah, in my work. Yeah, and I think, I think what was so interesting about um, the piece is because we also had brought our own <coughs> objects into the space. They become part of this strange present, past, future historical collection that we've kind of assembled in front of us. And it gets us to interrogate, how have we gotten here? You know, how have our personal histories intersected with the, the kind of longer stretch of the past of this country? Um, how have the kind of difficulties of, of hidden stories come to light? Um, and, and I think it, it's really interesting to see how kind of this also refracts through, um, we, we all became kind of characters in your work. We also played other roles later on. Uh, audience members had speaking roles in the trial, for example. Um, and, and I think I'm also very interested in, in looking at how Joe's characters have become historical characters almost in Malaysian history. You know, they've popped up very often over the past 30 years, over this very long duration of time. Um, and, and I'm curious as to how um, you and your characters, maybe separate or maybe together, um, as the various entities that they are, have, have also come close to in abrasion with um, the state, what, what, how the satire has rubbed against them or maybe fallen off them, um, how, how the characters that you've brought to life have come in contention with the powers that be, the narratives that be, have they had an impact or, or less than you, you hope they would, um, how, what are some of these tensions that you've had? Well, of course, there has been um, tensions with the state over the years. Um, at various points, at various performances, um, there has been, you know, we've had to meet with the Home Office and uh, had to have interviews by the police and things like this, but especially in the early days. And, and it's quite cyclical and it's quite, when it's not, Malaysia is very different from Singapore. We're quite disorganized, which allows um, subversion to happen, I think, more easily. I think it's very hard to be subversive here on many levels, so you have to be much more subtle. Uh, we can be quite uh, obvious, <laughs> I think, sometimes, and uh, because we have a very messy uh, system, um, you, you, I've always felt that I think we can uh, attempt to uh, be more in the op be out in the open about it. And I know that when Eastern Cafe first started, we did say very clearly to ourselves, um, we will just do it until we get stopped. So that's always been our, our <laughs> modus operandi. <laughs> Maybe we were young and foolish, but it did, um, it did help us. And it was an interesting relationship with the state because, of course, when the state was very powerful and felt very much in charge, they found us quite amusing. And I remember being called into the whole ministry once and they said to us, you know, you did this show and you said this and you shouldn't have said it, but we know, of course, you're just making jokes, but other people might not understand it. So you should be more sensitive and would you mind, you know, not because of us, other people may think. 
And so we're like, oh, I see other people, of course. So it's a kind of strange dance you do with authority. You meet in a room with them. There was a member, there was a no smoking sign, and they said, but you can smoke, you know? And here's some quay as well. So they're very polite. And, um, and of course, we knew that we weren't really going to listen to what they said, and we weren't really going to change what we did. Um, but they had done their job. They had ticked us off their list. They had done, they'd been responsible. Um, as government officials, and then we felt we had to be responsible as artists and then do our, our work that we needed to do. So those sorts of episodes happened, you know, not frequently, but sometimes. Um, and I remember we started getting invited to perform at government functions, in fact. It was, that was very interesting. I remember we, went, we were invited to perform at a, in Langkawi for what is a very big... Um, delegation of um, finance ministers and trade ministers. And uh, Anwar Ibrahim, who was at that point the deputy prime minister, having a lot of problems at that time, this is in 98, with the prime minister, he was the guest of honor. He sat at the front table and we performed um, what we wanted to perform and we said what we wanted to say. And he, was, he had his head in his hands most of the time. <laughs> but he was very visibly laughing. And, um, and later, his protocol officers grabbed hold of us and said, how dared you, how dare you? Why did you do that? You, should, you, you, um, you know, aired our dirty laundry in public. And as they were berating us, the doors opened, all the delegates came out. And they said to us, wow, we didn't know Malaysia had such an open democracy. <laughs> and, I, and I said to the protocol officers, you see, we are tools of the state, we lied for you. And I felt terrible, because I felt like maybe sometimes we were being in that way, um, you know, used. Um, and we, it was a very uncomfortable feeling. And I know the last show, my character of YB, one of the things he said was, he made fun of satirists. He said, yeah, those satirists, like those instant coffee people, he thinks, he said, they think that they are making a difference. <laughs> what a joke. They've made no difference at all. So I think in that way, we've often kind of had to reflect on the fact that we say these things. But it's, I think there's been some impact, maybe, um, I know that um, somebody has done a, some research recently on the impact that instant cafes had on Malaysian audiences. I know the impact is larger than the people in the room. And that's why I'm interested in what I think you were saying about gesture and how gesture reaches. I'm always interested in theatre, which is not what's happening inside the room of the theatre, but actually how other people are reading it somewhere else. And I remember going to Penang once many years ago, and this, because um, we performed in all kinds of strange spaces. And in this ballroom, this um, electrician came up to me and said to me, I love you. I love Instant Cafe, I love your company. I'm like, oh, Pachi, when did you see us? Oh, never seen you. <laughs> but he'd heard of us, and he said, I just like the fact that you exist. He liked he, that he'd heard what we did, and that we made fun of the government, and he said, that's, I love it, I love it. And he had switched his, um, his roster that day, so he could work in the daytime, so he could sneak into the ballroom and watch us that evening. So things like that, I felt, you know, there's another kind of impact that goes on beyond what's happening inside the theatre. The theatre is only a, a small place, but what's happening elsewhere is much more interesting. And because we used to perform in, in kind of like all these strange functions, and I was often quite resentful of it, but it was a way to make a living, um, I remember complaining to a friend of mine once and saying, oh, we've got to do a show, there's a thousand people, you know, half of them don't... And he said to me, you'd never get that audience coming to the theatre. These are people who don't go to the theatre. This is everybody from the CEO to the office boy, and they are coming in to watch your show, and you're reaching a big audience. And I realized, actually, then I was very grateful <laughs> that we had that opportunity to, to reach out to many more people. Mm. Um, I don't know if that answers your question about I, these I, characters. Though. Yeah, I know. I think it does flesh out also that, that dance that we constantly have to do. You know, when are we co-opted? When are we not co-opted? When are we subverting? When are we being subverted? When have the rules kind of t tables kind of turned against us? And the constant kind of shape-shifting that the practitioners do over time to align and realign oneself with, with the dominating structures yeah. that be. Well, I yeah. just want to talk about one incident which yes. happened, though. This was in 90... Oh, gosh, when was... 1999. When was Anwar arrested? 99 or... When was he arrested? When was the Black Eye incident? 98. 98. So Instant Cafe had been invited in 1997 then <laughs> to perform for the APEC conference in KL. So we're like, sure, we'll do it. And of course, then Anwar was arrested, put in jail, given a black eye, and we wrote a lot of material about this, um, this incident. And then, of course, we realized, oh, we've got this APEC conference coming up at the end of the year. What do we do? Do we do it or do we not do it? And we thought, we're going to do it. And if they decide to ask us just before the show not to do it, 
then okay, we have no choice, but let's do it and see what happens. <laughs> and so we did it. And there were a lot of references to Reformasi, a lot of references to what had happened, the sodomy accusations, etc. And after that, the government never asked us to perform again, of course. <laughs> but I think for us, it was a kind of culmination of that period for us, that we felt we needed to say this. And that, again, that idea that if you, if you, part of the dance is to say, okay, you asked us to dance, so we'll dance. If you asked us not to dance, then we'll, we won't dance. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think, um, and, and I think finally we turn to, to Jean to maybe talk about the, the last stage of your work that, that you're encountering right now. Um, you've brought us on this trajectory of moving from the very personal writing from a very specific but individual point of view to expanding to um, island narratives, community narratives, how you make sense of those things, and maybe you could share a bit more about yeah, the other kind of navigation you have to do. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I think there has been, for me, that, that, that shift actually away from personal to a more public, uh, uh, more public, public narratives, or, or other people's narratives, actually, not, 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 not necessarily public. Uh, I think one, one particular piece that I, I do want to talk about is uh, a piece that we did for SIFA uh, four years ago. Four years ago, yeah. So I think uh, uh, Kari mentioned, it, it's called It Won't Be Too Long, The Cemetery, Dusk, right? Because it was part of a trilogy. And, but this particular segment was actually a verbatim theatre piece. So we had gone around and interviewed uh, about 10 to 12 um, different uh, individuals who, had, who were involved in the, um, the planned, the government exhumation of uh, the Bukit Brown Cemetery in order to build a road through it, which has now been completed actually. Uh, and, uh, and so we interviewed different people, including um, the descendants of some of the people who were buried there, as well as uh, some of the, um, uh, the, the activists who actually came to Tomb Whisperers, and activists who actually became very interested in this issue and very passionate about this, this space, uh, the Bukit Brown space, and, and wanted to protect it. So people from the Heritage Society, from the Nature Society, um, and yeah, as well as individuals. And we also managed to get um, uh, government representation. So we we're very uh, fortunate to have the minister actually agree to speak to us uh, about uh, about the, I won't say controversy, but some of the discussions that they had over that period uh, in, 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 uh, in discussing how to, how to deal with this, uh, this, this exhumation, exhumation and I think kind of the, the kind of the rise of these, almost a, 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 a natural kind of sprouting of these uh, little civil activist groups that just came out of nowhere just because they were like, oh, this, this is an important piece of land and this is an important piece of heritage or nature and we need to fight for it. Uh, and the reason why I keep looking towards here is because Charlene was our dramaturg during that period. Uh, <laughs> And thank God for her. Um, yes. And so I think what was very interesting was this is, because this was verbatim theatre, so literally I cannot add anything. And uh, whatever they say and whatever we want to put into the play, we will actually uh, go back to them and to say, this is what we want to put in. Are you okay with this? And some were okay and some were not. And some would come back and like cross out sentences or they would correct their own grammar and we're like, it's, it's not about that. You know, you don't have to speak in perfect sentences. You know, it's really about capturing the few. And some were, would also cross out the, the bits that they felt were more uh, uh, sensitive. Yes. So, which was unfor unfortunate, but I think we had to respect that. And then, but then how do you put together, um, how do you extract from 300 pages of transcripts, how do you extract a storyline? Um, and how do you curate uh, 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 an arc for, for this experience uh, that, that these, these individuals had been through? So I think that was really the, a great challenge. Um, and like I said, I worked very closely with Hing Luan and with Charlene uh, in, in trying to find a shape uh, for the story. And of course, we had our own point of view. Um, so, but then you're also then representing individuals' voices, their verbatim, you know, their actual words, you know, sometimes with the actual pauses and the ums and the ahs. And, um, and I think most of the participants, most of the interviewees were quite happy with how they were represented. A couple were not 
as comfortable with how they came across, even though it was their own words. So that was rather interesting, but I suppose not surprising. Uh, but, but yeah, so the challenge was then how do you create a story? And um, I think one of the, the challenge has always been for me, so if I'm telling someone else's stories or if I'm taking history, how do I then create a story from this? Uh, like I mentioned, from when I was doing Senang, all the research on that, um, I remember there was a point of time when I was very pleased at how I, I found all the research and pieced together this riot, and I presented a draft of that, and then my mentor said to me, uh, yes, go back and look at it and now throw away all the history. Forget about the history, write the story. So I think as a playwright for myself, my responsibility is to the story. So I always say inspired by, and not necessarily, uh, you know, it, it, this is not, I'm not a historian, and I do not pretend to be one. So, uh, but what I do is I try to craft a narrative based on whatever skills I have and whatever material I have. And you may or may not, the audience may or may not agree with me, uh, but this is my raw material. And I think, um, and yeah, like I said, with Bukit Brown, we, we did go back to each of the interviewees to make sure that, yes, are you comfortable with this is, this is what you will be, you know, these are your words that will be put on, 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 on the stage. And I, I, I feel that was very important. Um, and then the last stage uh, of, of the, or the most recent stage, you know, not the last stage of my career, <laughs> is, uh, as I continue to explore, um, is actually, uh, I think, inviting people in and I think that comes back to, I think what you're doing with Ketamite and some of these other, you know, explorations and inviting the audience to bring their own histories and their own narratives into a space. Um, so last year with, uh, again with Drama Box, the director, Shui uh, we created a piece called Missing. And in this piece, uh, audiences were asked to bring an object uh, that represented a, a relationship that you had lost uh, or that had gone missing, a connection that you wanted you know, that, 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 that you had lost. And you would come to this, to, to Drama Box, you would place it, and it would be part of an installation. And then you were given a kit, and you would go out to a place where that meant something to you. And there were certain activities which you could do, or you might do, did not have to do, when you went out on your own expedition. You could go as far as you wanted, or you could just go downstairs. But I think it was really, whatever you wanted to put into it, you know, you would get out of it. Right? And however deeply you want to explore this lost relationship, you could. So we had zero, and I mean, there was an audio narrative that accompanied this, but we really had zero control as to what the audience would do, whether they would just go to McDonald's and have a drink, which I understand some of them did, you know, or, or if they would go to Bulau Ubin or whoever, you know, at the ends of Singapore. So, um, but I think when, when they came back, uh, we allowed them to share, you know, their experiences. And um, yeah, and I think that was about really letting the audience engage and to bring their own stories into it. So, so it's been an interesting journey for me. Like I, for me, I feel it's still about stories, but it's also about whose stories am I telling now. So it's gone from kind of my own stories to more, you know, different people's stories to, I think, allowing the audience the space uh, to... to um, to experience or to to reflect on their own experiences. Just two things that I'm also working through as we go on this. Apparently, there's this trajectory of introspective participatory theatre that Singapore is currently obsessed with, uh, at least for the past six months. And really, it came up in the morning uh, as part of some conversation too. You know, what are the ethical implications of dramaturging an audience? And this is probably segue into next year's edition of Dramaturgy or Participation panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but how do we uh, grapple with manipulating an audience? Let's just say that, it, it, you know, call a spade a spade. We are basically shaping an audience experience and asking them to go onto a very introspective, personal, reflexive journey. And do we have the skills and the ability to guide them through it and out of it um, in a sensitive and attentive manner. And number two, again, something I'm grappling with that Jean reminded me of. When are we sacrificing the, 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 the nuances or the details in telling our story for the sake of conveying a good narrative, for the sake of telling a good story? 
and being trapped within the aesthetics of theatre. And how do we, how do we, when, when are we able to say, I'm not going to sit, I'm not going to stage a good show because this story requires me for, me for me to say all these things and it cannot be a good theatre piece. Are we allowed to do that? And is, will the work circulate? Can I respond to that? I was just thinking, I mean, Janet, Janet brought this up yesterday as well. We talked about the dramaturgy of the state, right? And that the uh, politicians are very good dramaturgs. <laughs> And they have created this dramaturgy of the state that we are all um, uh, have been manipulated into believing as well. And they have no such compunction as you to think, do they have a right? Do they have um, an ethic, an ethical responsibility in doing it? They just are doing it. So I think as artists, I think we also sh should feel we have a right, but we are more ethical perhaps, or we should be, be more ethical. We should try to find a balance. But sometimes I feel when the state is so unethical, <laughs> um, and I think that's when we have to be a bit more blunt I, I mean, I feel as a Malaysian, I've had to be more blunt in the past because I feel that your, your, your power is so huge that if I don't come back at you very strongly, I will get swallowed up by your narrative. And that's why I think when I felt that I didn't have a, I didn't have a, his, a history, that then I have to create histories and we have to give other people voices for their histories. And maybe we, are, um, uh, are, we sometimes make a lot of mistakes, but I think what is the alternative is to have to hear nothing back. And I think that's even, for me, even worse um, than, than, because then, then the state narrative gets larger and larger and overwhelms us, um, you know, until we actually believe that it's a 200th anniversary of something, when it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Quite frankly, it isn't. Um, yeah, um, so basically a few years ago as part of CIFA, I did this production called I'm LGB, which is this indoctrination exercise that is commenting on the education system where I put 100 participants in lab coats and subject them to what I consider now quite violent gestures. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, for people who as have As someone who was there, I, I, I do agree. <laughs> And I think out of that violence, some but, productive conversation happened. Yeah. But that's exactly like what Joe was talking about. You know, since then I've been thinking, how do we avoid replicating these didactic and draconian gestures performed by the state on our bodies? How do we avoid replicating that violence as theatre makers? And how do we avoid replicating that violence when we choose to represent others and represent ourselves? And I think the answer is in encouraging a kind of duplicity or as Lytek or Zunian would say, like a double agent of sort, like this tactical fluidity that constantly flips the table and constantly allows for this duplicity of truths, differing accounts of memories and versioning of histories. This flipping of the table constantly. Well, no, I was going to say that I, I had the same issue, right? And so I think that's why my work moved from the public to the personal. And in fact, when last year I say we won the elections, part of me was like, oh dear, now I've got to go and do more political satire because I must make sure that I have a counter narrative to the new government, right? But actually I've been going into much more personal narratives because I began to feel, I didn't want to give YB, for example, any more airtime. I thought I'm tired of hearing those voices of those in power. And by me performing him, I was giving him more voice. And I thought that was wrong of me and I should stop. So I hung up the Sonko actually for some years. But last year after the elections, people kept saying to me, we want to hear from him. And I had such an issue this year trying to write him because I was feeling him coming through my body and really <laughs> he's so irritating. And I was trying to think, no, you lost, you lost the elections. And he said very smugly, no, I, I, won. I won my seat. And I had to admit that this had happened, that the power structure is still there, right? Um, but part of me wants to leave that behind and and go into the more personal narratives. And in one of the plays that I did, a friend of mine who came to watch it, um, and this very personal uh, narrative that I wrote, nothing to do with the state at all. And she said to me, oh, in some ways, I think this work is more subversive. Because uh, it, it, when you watch this play, she said, um, no one can deny that you are part of this soil. You are also Bumiputra. You are also a person of this soil. Um, you're, you, you belong. And I thought that was very interesting, that um, these personal narratives are also subversive in their own way, uh, maybe more deeply because um, they are not propaganda, <laughs> they're not oppositional, they're not reactive, they are merely story, 
not merely the our story, and therefore very fundamental. Thank you so much. Um, I think at this point, you know, we've, we've, we've entered quite a robust discussion of, of these, these various points. I'd like to open up to the floor for any um, questions. Yes, Robin. First of all, thank you very much, all three of you. It was very enlightening to hear. So I've got a question for each and every one of you. I'm going to start with Joe. Um, in 2011, I watched you perform in a play called Balik Kampong, where you played somebody who was imprisoned uh, for, as a journalist. And of course, today that I realized that your father's a journalist and dad. Just, I just want to find you, since we're talking about public and private, you playing that role, that, was it, how was it tapping into that and playing that role? You were very good in it, and there was something very palpable in that performance, and you playing opposite Zucania, in that the two of you, it was, there was something quite palpable in there. And then I wonder how much of your personal history was brought into that in terms of the theatre. So that's for you. Um, and for Zihan, I think the struggle that Zihan talks about is if indeed history, as um, Joe has put up, is fiction, right? So there, you putting something up, you're contesting authenticities. They are contesting versions of authenticities, right? So how, how would you be able to, to authenticate what you do, apart from the fact that you're doing it, and how is your revision of the past not also perpetuating whatever, like you said, apparatus of oppression that came before? You know, is that that, again, how do you safeguard yourself? How do you get that reflexivity? All right? And then for Jean, again, the whole idea of the self-appointed custodian of other people's voices. What is the responsibility and how do you deal with that? How do you come clean? Do you declare that? Do you... Do you make a pact with the audience? Do you deliver that in your writing? That you constantly have reminders that this is somebody's voice? Or how do you do that in order to, if you are indeed a custodian, protect those voices? Or to uphold the integrity of those voices of which you have borrowed, you have leased? Yeah, so that's my three questions. Well, luckily my father was never put in prison, <laughs> that was good. But I've had many friends over the years who have ended up in, in either in lockup or in prison long term, and of course have heard their stories. Um, I remember one of my friends who um, w went for a conference which I was supposed to be at and uh, didn't make it to uh, because I had a show to do in another state. Um, and he, he was in lockup um, and he had to stay longer than he people expected him to stay because he, his name is Cam Raslan, but he, is, uh, he's, uh, he, looks, very, he looks very Matsale because uh, he's mixed heritage. So people mistook him for another activist called Colin Nichols, Colin Nicholas, who is an Orang Asli activist. So he ended up staying in prison <laughs> longer because they looked at him and thought, well, you are the white guy, so uh, you stay in longer because you must be that person working with the indigenous people. And the guy who was actually um, Colin Nicholas was let out early, and he was very flabbergasted as to why this was. So, you know, this is a kind of very arbitrary and messy nature of, of our political system. But for inspiration for Balik Kampong, actually, um, I know your system here is far more inflexible and terrifying in a different way. And I read Teo So Lang's um, Beyond the Blue Gate for inspiration for that. I, even when I think about that book still, I, I shake slightly, because I think it's a very moving, very powerful account of her incarceration. So that was actually my, my more direct um, uh, research and um, uh, embodying, I think, for me. <laughs> tough, tough question. Uh, yeah, basically, the constant challenge. How do I authenticate to avoid how do I authenticate my own gestures in my practice to avoid replicating the apparatuses of oppression by the state? I, I think the two prongs, the first one is due diligence, due diligence in the form of the labor of care and the labor of maintenance. 
and I perform this labor of care in the objects that I choose to archive and I engage with, as thorough as I can be within the re with the resources I have, within the limited you know, reach that I, I can perform. Uh, so, in concrete example, so when I was researching for Katamai and I was digging historical documents for the case, you know, I exhaust or I attempted to exhaust all the possibilities of where I could glean this information from to ensure that the version that I'm reproducing is not just constructed from one citation or one account, but multiple accounts. Uh, and the other way I resolve it and I'm able to go to sleep at night uh, because it's difficult, uh, is knowing that I'm in the, at the end of the day, you know, you're a caretaker for information, you're a custodian for information. So it's important that you recognize that you're passing this information on, but not just passing it on, passing it on without closing it in the act of passing it on. So a lot of audience or several audience members came up to me after Katama and said, you know, but you didn't draw that link. You didn't draw that link on how our colonial history is linked to our objects, to the, our oppression and every day and how it's still persisting. Uh, but, but I didn't do the explicit link because I didn't want to close that knowledge on behalf of you or for you in a way that I think you should. Uh, and in a way, seeing yourself as the conduit for information to allow power or to n or allow knowledge to pass through you to another generation, to another being. I think it's a way of ethically grappling with that. I think. Uh, and it's supposedly Foucauldian in a way, you know, this care and this labor. It's a caring for and a self verification process uh, that you subject yourself to in the care for the self, you know, because that's the only way we can continue to make work uh, and, and to move on without being stuck. Or, yeah. Is that clear? Okay. <laughs> yeah, tough questions. Um, so my responsibility as the custodian of other people's voices. Um, so I guess most directly uh, for, for say a verbatim theatre piece, I think like I mentioned before for the Bukit Brown piece, then it was engaging them in discussion about what text exactly was being represented on stage and making sure that they were comfortable with that and respecting their decisions, whether they chose to, you know, take lines out or not. Um, so, but that's one, one form of it. Um, so, I've written other pieces where there's been, it's a bit more blurry, right? Um, so, in Bukit Hosui, there is a mix of a, a fictional character that's inspired by someone, but there are also other characters who speak I say characters, but other individuals who speak for themselves. Um, and I think for me, it was quite clear in that case that the, in, the, the, the invented character was, was, was fiction. Uh, so this was a fictional character, the, the fictional tour guide who had lost a, a, a sister in the fire in 1960s. And this was a purely fictional character, but some of the the memories, I would say, were borrowed from other people's memories. So, but it was quite clear that this is not based on, you know, some, someone. Uh, in a case like Chinatown Crossings, uh, I think it was very, yes, so, so this was an interesting case because, uh, you know, we had decided that it was important to represent um, a minority voice uh, in this, uh, or at least diverse voices in this piece. So we had a uh, Cantonese Matie, we had a uh, uh, a young girl, but we also, a young Chinese girl who was her ward, but we also had the, the friend, the good friend, and actually the main protagonist, Kunalan, who was the Indian boy who grew up uh, under the care of this mate. And, uh, and yes, when I wrote the first draft of the script, um, uh, I was very concerned about, about how I was representing this voice. Uh, and I think in discussion with, with Hui Ling, my director, who is also um, Chinese, uh, we decided that we really needed to, to, to find an Indian dramaturg to come on board the project. And so we worked with uh, Nanda or Hermang Yadav, and it was extremely, 
it, it changed the piece, right? So to have him on board and to have his voice and say, okay, this feels like a Chinese person speaking. <laughs> and it's like, no, the tempo is actually not about this. It is about this. And we're like, okay, yes, thank goodness. Uh, and I think that was, that was very... Um, so that, but that was something that I, I felt from the start that if I was to write the story, I would need to have his input. So I started the first draft without him, but after that, uh, having him come on board, it was, it was, uh, it was I would say more, more than invaluable, it was integral to the process. Uh, and I think together with him, we shaped the piece, or we rather we reshaped it, um, and we, we reshaped that perspective. Uh, but there are other cases. Uh, I mentioned my failed play, Saint, which I only wrote one act of, and then kind of tried to forget about it. Um, so Saint was, um, I think Joe mentioned, uh, you know, speaking to or reading uh, Teo Solang's book, which I also did, and I've met her, and she's a very inspiring uh, person to, to meet and to speak to, and I did want to write something of her experience as well, drawing from her experiences, and, uh, and I could not find a shape in a realistic play, in a uh, that was set in a you know in that realistic world, um, I could not find the right shape uh, or an authentic form for it. So eventually, um, I took the fragments of this play and I brought it into a very surreal world, um, a surreal play uh, called The Shape of a Bird, which was all about imagination. And so I created those scenes that I imagined with a female det uh, uh, detainee, uh, but it was in this kind of um, surreal world where she was using her imagination to recreate stories and she was a storyteller. Um, so I suppose that was one of my ways of dealing with it. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? We have, about, uh, we, we have time for a couple more questions if, the, if anyone has them. Any thoughts or responses um, to the works I mean, that's been shared so far? I think we've had a uh, the emphasis has been very Malayan or, or Singapore and Malaysian in, in terms of scope. And I'm also curious, maybe from other international participants, how your work also encounters other kinds of histories. We have, we have a certain kind of fixation with, with identity in Singapore and history in Singapore and certain kind of storytelling. But I'm also, you know, possibly interested to hear from, from, from other delegates or participants if you have any uh, comments about that. <laughs> Uh, a quick question. Okay, sorry. Hi, I'm Valerie Kineka Lucas uh, from Regents University, London. And I guess my question was one that was raised earlier, which is how does Singapore negotiate a colonial history that was not of its own making? You know, I mean, I was quite surprised, not in a good way, that um, Sir Stanford Raffles, whose wife wrote his autobiography and embroidered it quite a bit, that it was this, this kind of, the colonial masters were being sort of highlighted, or is this just part of a, a touristic agenda that artists are constantly having to battle against? Does that make sense? So recently there have been like a spat of several plays within this year that, because of the bicentennial celebration, so there's also been an active resistance or countering in response. So TNS is civilized, Miss British by the Esplanade, which I did the multimedia for, um, Aya Hitam by Sharon. Uh, so there are several projects and I believe several more projects in the pipeline working within the, the realm of aesthetics in a way, within the limited reach uh, that we have <laughs> as theatre makers to, to counter a sort of national uh, narrative, but like what Joe said, uh, you know, the state is always so intimidating in their their their, their scope and their size and their reach, uh, and and sometimes it's like David and Goliath, you know, that in terms of scale and impact and change and shifting of mindsets. Uh, but like for example, within Katamai, it's countering the colonial history, learning. It's not just countering as in refusing it, but tracking the connections of how things originated, where and when. Why is 
judgmental thing wearing a horsehair wig? And when did judges stop wearing it and why? And tracking the evolution of how our being, how our identity came to be and how it defines us. I think that's more productive. Um, maybe we can take uh, J Janet and then Robin. I'm just curious because the work, the, the history that you have uh, looked at, whether it's archival or contrasting it with the present, it's got a lot to do with past and present. And even Joe, in your case, um, other than their work, it's, you have suddenly put both the characters as going to participate in the next election. And so you also mention how you tried to bring to... So I'm curious about, you are taking history, you're presenting it now, and then you talk about this very big machine and the subtle, small work that you're doing. How do you see that affecting the future? Or do you feel, because now we start, you know, these kind of titles like human futures and all are starting to get into the theater world. And it's not easy in theater to actually talk about the future because of the nature of theater. So I'm just curious, um, do you, is, is it necessary or do you expect an impact or are you starting people off to why why this word futures is being dragged into the theater now so th th this is why the n it is absolutely necessary to think about theater beyond the here and the now and the event uh, and to think about the afterlives or the future lives of the performative gestures that we capture and we do today. So one concrete example is for Without, there was this Facebook page that archived all the materials that I worked with in terms of research. Uh, and using the Facebook timeline as an example of dating certain milestones in Paddy's life, but also in the production timeline. And also making sure that all the versions of each different night, because we live stream it on Facebook, each performance by Janice is captured. So there are five different versions floating around on this Facebook page that will continue to survive beyond myself, beyond me, uh, beyond Janice, beyond Patty. So it's ensuring, once again, the conduit, like we are the conduit for the information, but also shaping it in such a way so we don't close it or we don't foreclose it, and we allow for a potential future to come out from the next person who have to archive this and don't have to go through all the archival gestures that I have to go through. Yeah, so building a future. <laughs> Sounds like <laughs> propaganda, but maybe it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's two different things. I think that um, this idea that um, theatre is beyond what happens in the room, I think, is becoming increasingly important to me um, because I, 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 I perform so often in places which are not theatres. Um, partly because of funding, <laughs> because it's lack of money, so you perform in other kinds of spaces, and sometimes we had to perform in strange spaces because those people were paying us to perform there. <laughs> so you know, all these are kind of sometimes practical considerations, but I learned a lot from having to do that. And I've learned to appreciate it, though at, at the time I didn't. <laughs> Um, so I began to think about all those places which are not theatre spaces, which in a way are extensions of theatre spaces. So um, my YB character, for example, for the last four years has not stepped into a theatre. He's existed purely on YouTube. And this time when I performed, I realised most of the people who came to watch YB didn't know that I was YB. And some of the guests who appeared on stage with me and sat next to me and talked to me didn't realise it was me because they had they'd been watching viral videos of, of YB on YouTube, and my name is not attached, of course, because the fiction is he exists on his own. So that, for me, was, was very interesting because he then has a, a life as a real person who is diabolical, right? And, and, and that will remain in, in perpetuity to remind people, hopefully, of the diabolical people that we just got rid of, but that they are still out there. And the other thing is this um, idea of... Um, uh, 
Yes, and this is where I have a bit of guilt, you see, about this, because actually I don't want YB to run for, for, for Prime Minister at all, but I know that he does, and so, he had, so I had to allow him to say that he should be the next Prime Minister of Malaysia. I just hope he doesn't live, you know, long enough. And I've tried to kill him off quite a few times in the past. He's, he's, and he's, he's now 98 years old. I mean, he, he, he claims to be older than Mahathir. That's, that's his, that, and that's why he says he should be the next Prime Minister, because if you can vote in a 93-year-old, surely your next choice is a 98-year-old. Um, so I kind of think he won't survive, so it's fine. GE15, he won't be around. But I kind of have made a promise to people about Curry Spice. And she has said the next Prime Minister of Malaysia should be a bisexual Indian woman from Sentul. And I have put it out there because I feel I want people to imagine why not. Why are we going for the same story? Why we, even after a big general election where we said we changed everything, we changed little imaginatively. And now I think, do I actually have to follow through with this? And because so many people come up to me and said, I'll be on your campaign, I'll be your general manager. <laughs> people started coming up with slogans for me. A very good friend of mine, Ivy Josiah, who's an activist, a women's rights activist, said to me, we will put out your manifesto and I'll help manage your campaign. So she was very serious. And here I am thinking, this will be my last grand gesture in the political sphere of political work. And I want to kind of now start kind of going down the more private route of personal stories. And now I suddenly have given myself this big responsibility. How, how much am I responsible now I've put it out there? How ethical am I going to be by then saying I'm not going to run in any way? Um, but I felt it was important to put it out into the future because other people can then imagine why not. If there's somebody like Kari Spice out there saying why not have a bisexual Indian woman to be Prime Minister of Malaysia, um, maybe just that, Im that imagination being out there is important. Well, it was important to me anyway, and important to a few people. A few. We have time for one very last question. Tui? Very. My question is about post-show um, digestion for the audiences and to what extent you actually create spaces or how your strategies for creating that space for post-show, um, you know, so after the trauma of I am LGB or any other type of thing or as maybe when you're dealing, for example, with gene in flowers, where you deal with potentially very triggering or traumatic histories about sexual assault and things like that, and violence and patriarchy. Um, what are the type of strategies for maybe dramaturging conversations amongst audiences and with artists? Um, and maybe that is also where you bring in nuances that did not fit nicely into the space of theatre because why does everything have to be in theatre anyway? It just doesn't fit, then that doesn't fit lah. Like, you know, so I'll, I'll be interested to hear more from how you have used the post-show space or even pre-show space to um, scaffold the, um, your work for audiences. Maybe you can start with Jean. Um, sure, so uh, this piece that uh, Tui mentioned, uh, Flowers, is actually a site-specific work in a home where we have recreated a home uh, that is that used to where a family used to stay, uh, a brother and sister grew up, uh, but it, it's also it's a piece about uh, the impact, I guess, of patriarchal oppression uh, and and kind of the residual uh, damage, you know, the damages that it creates. So I think it was always. Um, I think for for Xue Mei, you know, as the director and creating this space, it was always very vital to her to have this decompression space, especially with a topic as sensitive as as, as that, uh, for audience members who are uncomfortable to be able to step out. And so, we, and we had a lot of discussion on where that decompression space could be, you know, backyard, you know, front porch, you know, that kind of thing. And, and certain spaces were just ruled out because, you know, you get stuck there, you know, you don't... So in the end, we, we, we left the space um, in the front porch. Uh, and uh, for me, I felt that peace especially really needed a post-show engagement, I, I, I felt that it would really benefit from um, a, dis, uh, you know, a kind of 
decompression or, or you know, a, a, an area to digest or just to discuss or just to open up conversations. Uh, and I think uh, with Drama Box, they've tried to make that space as welcoming as possible. And of, of course, um, I was all for like, yeah, let's force them all to sit down there and like talk to each other after that. And the chairman was like, no, 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 cannot. So, so I mean, it was, it was very open and it was really up to you. But, you know, we, we, there was an invitation to, you know, after you're done, would you like to... Yeah, and there was an exhibition that, well, uh, you know, with some of these um, the timeline of... Um, of, of, of I, I guess, these, these milestones, right, in, in Singapore's history um, that, were, that was laid out at that area. So I think people were naturally drawn to it to a certain extent, and there was a very open invitation for whoever wanted to stay and talk. And I felt that, I think for those who did stay and talk, that, that, that really impacted how they would have viewed the experience, especially something like that, which was so um, personal and so solitary, um, to have that space to actually open up discussion. Okay, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but thank you so much to everyone who's um, asked questions. Um, and, I just have and one last thing to say. Um, Joe, just to remind everybody, recently in Ukraine, somebody called Zelensky, who played a politician on TV, became a polit the president of Ukraine, so again, there is futures in the performativity of something like this. So curry spice. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Uh, I, think, I think this conversation is really focused, you know, not just on ethics of care when it comes to looking at history <laughs> and, and, and the way we engage with them, but also in aesthetics of care and the, in, in the, the kind of mechanics we put in surrounding each work. How do we make visible what is invisible? What is it we are duplicating? What is it we're replicating and questioning um, those narratives? So thank you very much. A round of applause for all the panelists, please.